Mr. Paul Krugman, who won a Nobel Prize in economics, he thinks that the world needs another bubble, that this would bail out the system and be beneficial to economic growth, and that the consequences of another bubble could be dealt with at a later stage. The problem is that he suggested this already in 2001, and we know now what the results were, which I'd like to summarize as follows. As you can see, at the end of the 1990s, we had a boom in the TMT sector, technology, media, telecommunication, and that drove the NASDAQ up. The NASDAQ increased in value by 48% every year between 1997 and March 2000. And between August 99 to March 2000, the NASDAQ actually doubled but uh, the Fed chairman, Mr. Greenspan, he didn't notice that there might be a bubble at that time. And then after March 2000, the Nasdaq started to go down very substantially. And the Federal Reserve became concerned that the U.S. could encounter a deflationary recession, in other words, a recession during which the price level declines. So they slashed interest rates, as you can see here, from 6.5% down to 1 three quarters percent by year end, and then down to 1% in 2003, and they left it at 1% until June 2004. And thereafter, they increased again interest rates, but in very slow so-called baby steps to 5 one quarter percent here in August 2006, and they left it at 5 one quarter percent and then after September 18, 2007, they slashed again interest rates to, at the present time, a Fed fund rate essentially of 0%. Now, this artificially low interest rates at 1%, and it has to be understood that the U.S. economic recovery in 2001 began in November 2001. In other words, almost three years into an economic expansion, we still had a Fed fund rate at 1%. And this led to a massive misallocation of capital. Most of the capital was flowing into the real estate market, and it led to a credit bubble. And I'd like to show you that actually the Fed's monetary policy of artificially low interest rates in this period here led to actually a destabilizing economy or a destabilized economy and also to higher financial volatility. Here you have the CRB. The CRB index is an index of various commodities, 20 different commodities, and it had peaked out here in uh, 1980 at uh, and after 1980, it had been in a bear market until here, 1999. And then it made a second low here at 185 in 2001. And thereafter, it had a sharp increase in price, driven partially by the additional demand from China for raw materials. And we went up and peaked here at 365 in July 2006, and thereafter the CRB traded sideways between July 2006 and September 2007, between roughly 280 to 320. But when the interest rate cuts came by the Federal Reserve here, you can see, after September 18, 2007, the CRB went ballistic and went up to 473. Now, officially, the recession in America began in December 2007. According to my calculations, the recession actually already began in October 2007. But the point is, here, had the Federal Reserve not cut interest rates aggressively, the CRB would not have gone up to this extent because the global economy was certainly slowing down. What happened in the global economy is the global economy went into recession in 2007, in December, and then there was a slowdown in 
demand and then between September 2008 and March 2009 the global economy fell off a cliff with the private sector contracting by between 20 to 30 percent. The government sector, which in most countries is around 50 percent of the economy, didn't collapse because obviously it's, uh, the government can continue to pay salaries and transfer payments and so forth. But basically the private sector collapsed by 20 to 30 percent, in other words, individual businesses. So that the CRB kept on rising here between the end of 2007 to July 2008, in July 2008, the global economy was already weak. That this happened is due to the artificially low interest rates which we had at that time here in this period after 2007, September, where the Fed fund rate was slashed to 0%. So all I want to say, and this is important to understand, that artificially low interest rates lead to misallocation of capital and as I shall discuss at a later point also to excessive speculation. By the way in the case of oil we can see the same. The oil price had bottomed out here at $10 in 1998. It had been at $50 on the spot market in 1980. It had been in a bear market and then we had this rise here to around $75 in July 2006. And then we traded between $65 and $75 until the Fed cut interest rates here and then we went up to $147. And as you know, after we totally collapsed down to $32 on December 28, 2008. And since then, the oil price has more than doubled. So basically, the Fed's policy leads to a lot of volatility in the economy and also in asset markets. Another consequence of the Fed's policies is obviously the excessive debt growth we had in the United States and you can see here this is total credit as a percent of the economy which has increased very substantially in the last 25 years. The last time we had strong increase in credit was here in the 1920s and at that time total credit as a percent of the economy peaked out at 186 percent. It then went up during the depression because during the depression nominal GDP collapsed but basically we went in 1929 into the depression with a debt to GDP of 186 percent. This time around we had a debt increase from 140% of GDP in 1980 to now 375%. So we go into a recession with a debt to GDP of 375% in the United States. But that excludes future liabilities arising from Medicare, Social Security and Medicaid. If you add it, these liabilities, these future liabilities, which amount to, 49, to $59 trillion, then debt to GDP would be over 600%. So basically, this is an important factor, but the reason I'm mentioning it is that Mr. Paul Krugman, who won a Nobel Prize in Economics, recently published an article in the New York Times in which the title was how did economists get it so wrong? Well, the title should have been How did I, Paul Krugman, get it so wrong? Because he also, in 2001, had advocated money printing and uh, essentially an increase in fiscal deficits, which obviously at that time were the wrong medicine for the economy. But the reason I'm mentioning this is that in the 6,000 words article of Mr. Krugman, which was very detailed, nowhere does the word excess credit growth or excess leverage appear. It, doesn't, it just didn't occur to the Federal Reserve and leading economies in the United States that this excessive debt growth would be destabilizing on the economy and have in a downturn a very negative impact. 
Now, the other reason I'm talking about this is that 